Okay. <laughs> um, today's lecture, hopefully, I always say, uh, I think it'll be short, but we'll see. I got my timer going. Um, today, uh, since we didn't have time to cover this in class last time, we are going to go through and talk about Newton's third law of motion. Okay, now, uh, again, if I ask people, uh, you know, can you tell me about this? One of my, one of my uh, things that I usually do is say, do it in the fewest amount of words uh, so that I, I understand you have like a focused understanding. So when it comes to Newton's third law of motion, if you are going to give me just a couple words to, to try and illustrate that, yes, I know Newton's third law and kind of what's going on, uh, I think the two best words would be equal, opposite. Uh, that would be the best. Now, another pair that you could throw out, which uh, I'm going to say is okay, but not quite as good as equal and opposite, would be action, reaction. Um, that really doesn't imply the equal and opposite thing, so I, I would go with equal and opposite before I'd go with action, reaction. Uh, now the wording for Newton's third law of motion, I'm going to be a little bit pickier than what, what people usually throw out there. Um, for every, this is where we're going to be picky. Most people say for every action, we are going to say for every force, there is an equal and opposite force. Okay, and you'll notice that the thing that is a little bit different from what most people throw out there would be the use of force, specifying force, instead of just saying action, reaction, which in saying that force is implied, but since our unit now is on force, that's, that's the slight change we would say. So, here, this is kind of the overview of what Newton's third law of motion says. Uh, and now what we're gonna do is we are going to take a look at some examples of this. Um, and the, the first one that we're gonna look at, um, which I guess I could say I'm trying to model up here against the whiteboard, and this is probably the simplest action possible, is if I push against the wall, the wall pushes back against me. So if we made a quick little picture here and put the wall and I'm not even gonna try my, that's me. Uh, if I push inward on the wall, and I could say, I could call this F me, according to Newton's third, third law, that means there is an equal and opposite force that pushes back on me, and we could say that that is the force of the wall. And the harder I try and push into the wall, the harder the wall pushes back on me. Now, most people do not have a problem with this particular application because when they look at equal and opposite forces, when you have two things that operate in, the, in opposite directions and you talk about, well, how much overall force do we have there? Well, we have none and the wall doesn't seem to be moving. So that seems to make perfect sense to me. Um, but this application of Newton's third law also applies when things are actually moving. So what we're gonna do is we are going to change the situation here and instead of pushing against an object that is not going to move at all, what we are going to do is we are going to, I'm gonna draw this a little bit bigger this time. Um, for this particular example, I always like the idea of a refrigerator box. Um, and so I'm here 
you know, or a person's here, and they are pushing on the refrigerator box. Um, but this time, the refrigerator box actually moves to the right here. So what we're going to do is we are going to break down um, how is it that Newton's third law of motion, this idea of equal and opposite forces, still applies even though an object actually moves. Because if this refrigerator box actually moves to the right, I think most people would say, aren't you pushing more? And that's why the refrigerator box actually moves that way. And it's a little more complicated than that when you really get down into the weeds of Newton's third law of motion. So in order to do this, we have to understand that there are actually two different interactions here. There is one interaction, um, and I'm going to do this one in uh, black. There is an interaction between the person and the refrigerator box. So the person pushes on the refrigerator box. So we'll call this F person. And according to Newton's third law of motion, there is an equal and opposite force, and I'm just going to call it box, that the box pushes back on the person with. So here's where, if this is where we stop, people would say, okay, then why does the refrigerator box even move? Because those like balance out. And the answer to that is, there's another area where we have forces at play. And I'm going to change colors for this one. I'm going to go to red. We have another thing going on down here between the box and the floor. Um, when this person tries to push this box forward, there is an interaction of the box with the floor where the because of the person pushing forward, there is a force here of the box on floor. But because this box is trying to go forward against the floor, there is a resistance to that of the of a force of the floor on the box. Now again, they're equal and opposite, but this particular force here, it seems really fancy, but we have a name for that. Friction. So this is where there is a resistance to the box actually wanting to move forward. So in the end, what determines whether or not this refrigerator box actually slides forward depends on what is the size of this interaction force. And again, there is an equal and opposite thing going on there. But what is the size of that value compared to the size of this box and floor interaction? So in the end, if I was actually able to push the refrigerator box to the right, what that means is the amount of force present in the person box interaction is greater than the box and the floor interaction. And this would slide forward. If the amount of force between the box and the floor is greater than how I'm push how hard uh, I would be pushing up here, then the box would not actually be moving. But we would still have these two kind of, uh, what they refer to them as are action and reaction pairs of forces. So if I'm not pushing on the, on the box, then there's no force of the box trying to push on the floor here. Um, and when we say the box pushing on the floor, we're talking about the interaction about having it try to slide over the floor. There's none of that because this isn't trying to be moved. So this idea between how hard the person pushes here and the ultimate uh, force that the floor pushes uh, back on the box with 
it's the interaction between these two things that I'm pointing at particular forces right now that determines whether or not the box actually ends up being able to move to the right. So uh, most of the time when we analyze this, we would just say the person's pushing on the box and we would give it a single arrow to the right. And down here for friction, we would give it a single arrow to the left. But that's not completely correct. Uh, but the truth is that getting into these action and reaction pairs can be really, really tricky. And so that's, uh, we usually we deal with a simplified uh, version of all of this. Okay, uh, sometimes people uh, refer to this kind of situation in the old days. They called it the horse and the cart problem because people would talk about, oh, if you have a horse that's pulling a cart, if the horse pulls on the cart and the cart pulls equal and opposite to the horse, how does the cart ever actually move forward if you have those equal and opposite forces because they would just add up to zero? And that would be like only focusing on the black arrow forces here and not looking at the bigger picture and realizing there is a second interaction between the object and the ground. Okay, so this is kind of a, a very detailed uh, view of the of Newton's third law. Now, if one other thing that uh, people would ask you about Newton's third law would be, can you give me an example? And we did do one example, but you know, uh, there are better examples uh, without getting into the detail of what we just did uh, to talk about Newton's third law of motion. And so if somebody ever asked you about, give me, uh, prove to me that you know where Newton's third law of mo motion can be applied. In my opinion, the one word that you need to bring out is propulsion. Now remember, propulsion is kind of a fancy term for going forward. Uh, but if you think of Newton's third law, the idea it would be if you want to go forward, that means what you have to have first is something that acts backwards. So uh, I'm going to start with what I think is the simplest and the most beautiful example of this, walking. The next time you walk and, and uh, think about what you're doing. When people say, I would like to walk forward, uh, what do you do? Most people will focus on, well, I'm gonna take my, the leg that I'm, I'm lifting up and I'm gonna throw it forward. But what you want to think about is, what are you doing with the, your foot that is still on the ground? So if you want to walk forward, when you go to walk forward, you may throw one of your legs for, uh, in front of you, but what you do with the ball of your foot is you push back. And this is the force of you on floor. But as long as you have enough friction between your foot and the floor, your foot is not going to slide backwards because of that. And because you are pushing back on the floor, there is a forward acting force of the floor on you. And when you look at the interaction between the two objects involved, we have you and basically the earth. And because of the size difference between the two, the earth is not going to be moving backward because you're pushing on it. And as a result of that, you get pushed forward and you walk. Now, if you go from a walk to a sprint, the only difference in this mechanism is you increase the amount of force that you push back on the floor with. And again, because you're pushing on the earth and it's not going to move, that propels you forward at a faster rate and you're able to move faster. Uh, if you were on a very slippery surface, you would you have experienced the the I, the sensation that okay I can't push back very hard on the ground because I'm just going to slip, and so 
uh, if you get into a scenario like that, one of the things that, that we have developed are things like spikes so that they actually, they physically dig into the surface so that you don't slip as you push backwards. But as far as Newton's third law of motion goes, the main thing that I would have you remember is you can't go forward until you push back on the ground to begin with. Now, second um, scenario that I want to bring out to you uh, is a car tire. And for this matter, this same discussion would apply to bicycles and things like that as well. If you were to ask most people, why does a car go forward? They would say, well, because the tires roll. So if we are trying to take our car forward, that means the tire would rotate in that direction. But the only place where, where you get a force that would drive the car forward is in the interaction with the tire and the ground. And because the tire is wanting to spin in the picture that I've put together here clockwise, at this spot down here that's called the contact patch, where the tire actually touches the ground, it actually is trying to push backwards on the ground. So this one is the force of the tire on ground. But because of Newton's third law, that means the ground exerts a force, ground on tire, and because of the rolling motion, that is what drives the car forward. And just like I mentioned earlier about walking, if you are on a very slippery surface, you know that you cannot push back very hard because you would just slip. Because uh, there's not enough of, of a, a traction interaction that keeps you anchored with the ground. The same thing applies with cars. If you've ever uh, seen a car like spin its tires, the tire is still trying to spin backwards, but if there's not enough engagement so that you can get an equal and opposite force, you end up basically exceeding the amount of friction and then the car tire just spins in place. But again, remember, you cannot move forward until there is a backward acting force to begin with. So, two very important things in our daily lives, walking and uh, driving a car. Now, another one that's usually thrown in here is a rocket. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw the rocket sideways here, and it's pretty pathetic. Uh, but if we have a rocket, like traveling through, through space, uh, most people will draw you know, flames or some kind of exhaust coming out in one direction. But the rocket actually moves forward. So the Newton's third law interaction is happening right here at the rocket engines. Because as the rocket fuel is combusted and the chemical reaction occurs, that generates gases that are thrown out the back. And in the process, there is uh, the force of the gas that is, that is wanting to be ejected backwards. Um, and what that ends up generating is a force of the gas on the rocket, which then propels it forward. Okay, so this is your... Uh, this is your treatment for uh, Newton's third law of motion as far as propulsion goes. So remember, anytime you wanna go forward and you actually move forward, if you look carefully at that situation, you should be able to identify a backwards acting force that somehow engages you to allow you to move forward. Now, I will have, I'm gonna do two other things very quickly here uh, in terms of uh, an application. Uh, and this, this has to do with two exercises that I think is kind of an interesting uh, take on Newton's third law of motion. And it has to do with that equal and opposite thing. 
the idea of this thing that we call a push-up, and I'm not going to do a push-up for you. Uh, I, I swear I can. Uh, so let's say you're going to do a push-up. If you think of what you do to do a push-up, you actually push down on the ground. But because you're pushing on the earth, it's not moving. And as a result of that, there is an equal and opposite force that is generated upward that takes your body upward. So if somebody wanted to talk about what should we name the push-up correctly, at least from the perspective of the exerciser, the answer would be push down because you are pushing downward on the ground. But as a result of Newton's third law, you move upward in response to that. And the other exercise that I would argue is misnamed is the pull-up. Because if you think about what you do during a pull-up, you grab a bar up above you, and what you are trying to actually do is pull that bar down to you. But because it is set up in a rigid fashion, hopefully, um, it's not going to move, so your downward acting pull ends up translating to an upward acting force to try and pull your body weight up. So in both cases, you can also see Newton's third law of motion, okay? So if you're ever gonna highlight Newton's third law for somebody, what you have to be able to point out is this, there's a, it may look like there's only one force acting in one particular direction, but somewhere in there, there is an accompanying force that acts in the opposite direction. And sometimes that is the force that we often overlook. And all we notice is uh, kind of the resulting force that makes something actually move. Okay, so I think we've pretty much beaten Newton's third law to death. So hopefully you've learned a little bit about this and you could give me a good example if, if you needed to at any time. So, whew, and I just went over 20 minutes, but hopefully this was informative. So. Uh, we can continue on with Newton's other laws of motion next time in class. Thank you. See you next time.